Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Una Dolce Vita with uh, Sophie and Elizabeth McKilly. I am thrilled to have them all, to have them both on this uh, on this chat. I'm Mark Rotella. I'm the director of the Coach Institute for the Italian Experience in America here at Montclair State University. And I am th very happy to be partnering with the Montclair Literary Festival, which uh, we're, we're thrilled about here in our town of Montclair, New Jersey. So um, without further ado, I just want to introduce our guest. So first is Sophie Minkili, author of The Sweetness of Doing Nothing, which just, which just came out a couple of weeks ago, and her mother, Elizabeth Minkili, who's the author of The Italian Table and so many others that I have been familiar with and are in my library. And um, we're here. Uh, they live in Rome. And uh, welcome. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Thrilled. So before I just want to show you, here's this. Okay, this is Sophie's book. I, I want everyone. It's 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 a really really sweet book. It's a handy pocket size. And this is um, you know I've I've got several of Elizabeth. This is the one that I happen to have closest to me because we're going to be my family. I'm going to be traveling to Rome soon. Um, there is a button uh, right below the screen. Uh, it says uh, "Buy the sweetness of doing nothing." Here you could buy that. Uh, but uh, uh, Elizabeth's books will also be uh, there as well. So. You could buy the books. Um, so anyway, welcome. Hey, thank you. Yeah. So Sophie, I'm going to start with you because, as we said, this is your debut book. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very excited. I bet. I mean, this is this is really this is really wonderful. It looks like you know it's there's a lot of love that was put into this, and and maybe not a lot of doing nothing because it takes a bit of work. So. <laughs> A little. And it was actually supposed to come out in 2020. So I've been waiting for it to come out because it got postponed two years now. Um, but yeah, this is my first baby. I'm very proud of it. And uh, I love it. I hope you do as well. Excellent. Well, you know, and, and it's a good thing it did wait because now people can enjoy this, get it in their hands. We could all gather. We could gather with people more or less. I don't know what it's like now in, in Rome and throughout Italy, but I want to start first. Okay. Sophie, what was the inspiration for this? How did this come about? Well, basically, it's my love letter to Italy, so the country I grew up in. And a lot of the things I talk about in the book are things that I took for granted as a kid growing up here. You know, it was just normal for me to be surrounded by constant beauty, beautiful art, architecture, people having huge plates of pasta on a Sunday lunch, gelato every afternoon. And then it was only after I went to university in London that I realized, wow, I actually miss those things. <laughs> and I'm very lucky to have grown up that way. And so this is sort of my love letter to the country that raised me. And do you feel in Rome, and this is both for you, Sophie and Elizabeth, that this way of life is still being lived? Well, it's a, a busy city, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Rome is a big city and times have changed everywhere, all over the world. So I would say like one of the things has that has changed is when I was a kid, almost everybody would take a huge lunch break. So no matter if it was a shop, post office, an office, people would shut down and go home, have lunch, have a nap, and then calmly go back to work. <laughs> but, but not only that, I don't know if you remember, but when you were growing up, all the stores closed on, on Thursday afternoons. Oh, like, and Mondays and, and, Mon Sundays. and Monday mornings. <laughs> so I would have to make sure like I had enough food in the house on a Wednesday afternoon because I wasn't going to be able to buy anything on Thursday, weirdly mm. enough. And, uh, and that's changed. That's now. changed. <laughs> Everything's open all the time a bit, which is which is a little sad, yeah. I think. But I, I mean, feel like small family shop don't stores, they still close and uh, go home for lunch or go have a lunch break and then open up again. But yeah, things have changed, but people still live, I think, in the way I grew up with. Yeah, I feel like we have more time to see friends and, and sort of literally do nothing than, for instance, when we go back to the States, I feel. Well, this is, I, I want to ask Elizabeth a question. Well, I'll ask that now, then I'm going to go to my next one. But so, Elizabeth, you were born in St. Louis, uh, raised born. in St. Am I right? St. Louis? I lived there till I was 12. And then you moved to Italy. Your folks up moved, decided to move to Italy. I mean, is there much of that? And, and I know you came back here, I believe, to go to school, to go to university. 
is there much of that? I mean, tell me the difference of you know what it was like for you adjusting to to Italian culture from um, Missouri. Well, I mean, I was 12 years old, so I was extremely upset about <laughs> being moved over here until I was here, and at which point I immediately adapted because I was 12 years old. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and I think because I was 12 and 13 years old, I was very, uh, you know, impressionable. And yeah. so that was a, a period in my life when Rome made a huge impact on me. And I came back every summer with my parents and uh, with my father. And um, and then when I you know became an adult, I made the conscious choice to come back here first as uh, working on my uh, PhD, and then I stayed and married an Italian man, and then had an Italian child, <laughs> and um, and another Italian child, and um, and you know started my career. So um, I think it was it was not a hard sell moving yeah. here. So uh, throughout your travels, and I'm going to go from broad to, to to micro, getting into the into the book. Do, do you feel that this lifestyle, uh, this this is is similar throughout Italy, or does it change from region to region? I mean, I imagine I've been to Milan. I, it feels more of a New York pace, but perhaps I know uh, uh, Elizabeth, your your husband is from Puglia, I, I guess. Sophie, obviously, your father from Puglia. You go to the countryside. Um, is this the same kind of pace? Is is this universal throughout Italy? No, it's very different from north to south. I mean, yeah, in the north, I mean, people are known to be more business focused and um, on time. On time, yeah. <laughs> I feel like in the south of Italy, uh, things are slower, more relaxed. Um, these huge Sunday lunches I talk about in my book, I definitely experienced them more in the south of Italy. So Puglia, where my dad is from, that's so Italy is shaped like a boot. So Puglia is the heel of the boot. And I spent a lot of my holidays there, my summers. I have a lot of friends and family there. But don't you think also people, I mean, Italians are always hospitable. But as you go south, I have the, they're, they're more willing to sort of take time off their normal life to invite you in and you know if you ask somebody directions in Milan they'll look it up on the phone and you know show you where to go whereas if you're you know going through Puglia or Sicily they'll say follow me and you know and just sort of show you the way there and and they're willing to sort of take it slowly to 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 meet people to I don't know life life moves on a different schedule I think there. because it's so sunny people that live in the sun are in a different mood <laughs> This is true. I'm originally from Florida, so uh, and I totally get that vibe. It changes. Um, so, Sophie, with this book, you say in your introduction, one of the things that you were conscious of and and perhaps a little trepidatious of, and you said you know, about you know, you've talked about this on Instagram, is kind of um, you know promoting this this stereotype of Italians as being lazy through this this idea of um of 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 the easy life of 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 the, of the sweetness of doing nothing that was one of your concerns can you talk about that a little bit yeah so i've been using instagram sort of to show my life here in italy and the people i meet and what people are doing for a while now and um most of the reactions are positive and they're like I would love to live that way. Where do you find these people? How can I live like them? And then I got a few comments over the years saying like, oh, you're only showing lazy people. Why isn't anyone working? Why are they playing cards all day or eating gelato or having coffee? And at first it made me think like, mm, am I only like taking videos and pictures of people that are doing nothing? But then I thought, I mean, this is real life. These are people that I see every day and talk to every day and grew up with. And this is the way people are living. But the people who were commenting, they were Italians. Yeah. That were making these comments. They yeah, weren't, sure. they weren't like, they weren't Americans or other people from other country. They were, they were Italians. Yeah, they were Italian. They were scared that I was showing. They wanted me to show like young men in a suit going to an <laughs> office in Milan, but that's not what I was seeing in my life because I was spending so much time in Rome and Puglia and Sicily and I wasn't spending time in Milan. And to me, I was, um, I mean, I was happy about the happy reactions because I, that is the type of life I want to live. And I guess a lot of other people want to live that way as well. And I think people sort of think we're romanticizing it because we're showing that side of it. 
but it is a side that exists and it's a side that's easily accessible not just to us but to anybody who makes the effort to go to these places you know you know you've gone to these small towns in in calabria. In, in calabria and you know that this kind of life exists if you if you make the effort Right. And and that was going to be my other question. Does the stereotype go the other way? Uh, 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 as Elizabeth, you had just uh, uh, discussed about like, oh, everyone is happy and leisurely takes the time in Italy because it's paradise. Um, well, no, I'm not. I mean, you know, real life exists here, yeah. too. Obviously, and, and, you know, there's poverty and, and there is, you know, immigration problems and there's politics. But um, I would say that, yeah, but I think there's also the good part that people have, which is family and, you know, and, and they have different priorities. And so I think where people, you know, even, even when life isn't easy, I think that there is, um, the, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, think there's a good balance for Italians to like separate work life and real life. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so once work is done, that's it. And if they want to take time off work, they will. Um, I think they, they work to live. They don't live to work here. And it's been that way ever since I can remember. And, and probably I, before that. Right. And I think this is exactly what your, your, your book touches on is the work, you know, the, you know, work to live, not the live to work. I think that's what you said. Yeah. But, but also how... Um, and, and you address this a little bit, how doing nothing, how taking pleasures in in those lives can is actually productive. Yeah, I think Italians figured out that to I feel like in today's society, the more we do, we have to, we have this to do list. We have to check off all the time. We feel guilty if we're not doing anything. The sense of guilt is always following us no matter where we are. And Italians have figured out that in order to be more productive and work better, actually doing less is better. So you need downtime to produce more and they don't feel guilty at all. If you think about it, if you come to Italy in the month of August, mm -hmm. most cities will be ghost cities. So right. Rome will be completely empty. Nothing's open. Everyone's at the beach for the whole month. Right. So they'll be better in September and they'll be able to work better. <laughs> and they're recharging with family. They're recharging in nature. They're recharging at the sea. And it's, um, it's a, it's not, um, I mean, it's a conscious decision, I think, that people make. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's take, let's go now dive into the book. And and I'm going to use your book, Sophie, as, as this guide point. And Elizabeth, please, you know, comment because you have been living this as well and writing about it for, uh, uh, you know, over two decades. So um, let's just start with a simple cup of coffee. Your simple coffee. Talk about that. You coffee? What is the culture around that? Well, I feel like because we would travel to the States so much when I was younger, one of the things that shocked me when I was a kid was um, that everyone would walk around with these huge cups. I remember asking my mom, like, why is everyone walking around with a flower vase filled with <laughs> coffee? Like, it's huge. I just found it so confusing because here there's no takeaway culture. So, if you ask, if you go to a coffee bar and ask for takeaway coffee, they'll put it inside those like small plastic cups that they give you at the dentist, which will burn the tips of your finger off <laughs> and then cover it with tin foil and then put it on a tray for you to take somewhere. <laughs> they don't understand <laughs> what you have to take it. What do you have to do with that? Takeaway well, because, coffee? We, because coffee culture here is all about going to the bar and having the interaction with the, with the person making the coffee, but also the person standing next to you. You know, that comes mid-morning, I usually send Sophie a message. She lives down the street, and I said, you want to meet for coffee? You know, even though we see each other all the time and talk to each other all the time, just stopping our day, going and getting a coffee is a way to, you know. And there's also the whole thing about how Italians are very attached to their coffee bar. So you end up going to the same place for your whole life. We have been going to the same coffee bar for my whole life, 30 since, years, since, you, before, <laughs> since you were before I was born. So the people actually making the coffee become like your second family. They know everything about you. You don't even have to order. It's uh, it's like a family. So I want to talk about this institution of a bar in, in Rome. This is, I, I absolutely love going for a little uh, pick-me-up, a quick espresso, 
very little you know seldom do you sit at the at, at a table if you do sometimes you pay a little extra but i want you to give us a, what is this institution of the bar in in rome uh both well, what it looks like, like and socially what it, what it serves i feel like there's as many bars as there are churches in rome it's just on every corner and it's because the bar is not only a place for coffee here it's a place where you can go for lunch because uh, usually the owner will cook up something. It's just like the food you would have at home. It's simple right. cooked food. And then it's a place you would meet your friends for aperitivo before dinner. And then usually people also have different bars they go to at different times of the day. Like, for instance, I have the bar I go to in the morning when I'm with my husband. I have the bar I go to with Sophie, you know, in, at mid-morning. And then a bar I meet my friends at after lunch. And these are all in our neighborhood. There are three different bars. So it's a very specific part of everybody's daily routine yeah and they are like a second family so you're also very loyal to them i feel like italians don't care so much about the quality of the coffee mm -hmm. but it's more about the place so like even though the place i've been going to for 30 years doesn't make the best coffee in rome i would never change which is why which is why we're so confused when people write us on instagram you know where do you get the best coffee in rome which is like just a question no roman would ever ask no Right. Oh, interesting. That's good. So tell me another institution that is part of this, where 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 people go to perhaps do nothing, even if it means socializing or being with friends. I would say the bar, but maybe the other thing that comes to mind is summers are a huge thing here and Italians love the beach. And Italian beaches, if you ever come here, you'll see their uh, divided in stabilimenti they're called so they're like uh, beach clubs beach clubs and um, they have chairs and umbrellas and Italians <laughs> will go to the same beach club same umbrella same chair every summer for their whole life these these chairs and umbrellas get passed down from one family <laughs> member to the next <laughs> so mm. they reserve it for the rest of their life and that's and then the Italians have a whole routine for the summer. So you go to the same place, the same chair, and then there's the same families around you. You have lunch at the same place, nap time. It's just a whole, it's about routines. And they like going to the same places over and over. It's comforting. And there's a sense of familiarity, which it seems Italians uh, are drawn to, the sense of familiar. Exactly. So now let's talk about another institution. And this is uh, uh, not a place, but um, in the United States, for many Italian Americans, Sunday, Sunday night is the time for family. It's you hear about this. This is, I think, for some, you know, many Italian families here, it's still something that happens uh, is, is the Sunday gravy, is the Sunday dinner, the big Sunday dinner. But as you write, Sophie, Sunday night uh, in Italy is a night for another food. <laughs> it's pizza, pizza night. night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because usually Sunday lunch is the biggest meal. So you would have a really long meal. It's where we would have like a starter, pasta, a meat course, desserts after your lunch drinks. And then you take a long nap, you take a long walk, and then you'll meet up with friends for a light dinner. And pizza is the light yeah, dinner. Yeah, pizza is basically like not eating. Yeah, it's a light meal here. And so you have a beer and a pizza Sunday night. I was just going to go to that. Uh, uh, is it beer or wine? I, I understand Italians prefer beer with pizza. Is that is that it? If if I order a glass of bread, there's no option. Just, what's that? There's no option. You're only allowed to have beer with pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the only time some Italians will have like a soft drink. Yeah, they would also have like a Coke or a Fanta with their pizza. But it's sort of a special occasion kind of thing. Yeah. Have you seen? Um, much of, of an American influence or an Italian American influence with in Rome or in Italy that you've seen in the food? Well, I think that some of the trends cater towards uh, the American tourists that are here. For instance, yeah. if, whenever we see somebody walking down the street with a coffee cup, we know they're American. <laughs> And, and or from somewhere else. Or from somewhere yeah. else. From somewhere else that have, yeah. you know, and yeah, from somewhere else and not Italian. So those kind of like kind of things. But I think a lot of the sort of trends, like fast food trends, don't do 
very well here. Right. No, there's not a lot of big chains. I feel like now they're opening up um, like poke places and like an avocado bar. And it's more for like Italian teenagers and this whole like Instagram craze of taking pictures of cool food. But one thing that has been a big uh, uh, part of a big part of the change that I think is very much influenced by America. I, I'm sure you remember when you were here, you know, 25 years ago that you could eat lunch from like one to three then all the restaurants closed and then you could eat dinner right. from eight to 10 and you couldn't eat during the rest of the day. And one of the big changes is that restaurants now are open. They're more flexible. Some, some of them can't really define what they are anymore. If they're restaurants, trattorias, they're bars, they're whatever, but you can sort of eat all day long. And that's both aimed at tourists, but it's also aimed at Italians that have a busier sort of more hectic mm -hmm. lifestyle these days. So that's, I think that's a, an interesting development. I've, I've noticed when I was there, especially in uh, Trastevere, there are certain bars where I could go for a glass of wine, but then they have a whole assortment of, of, of antipasti or something, like little sandwiches or, or meats and cheeses. Is this common throughout Rome uh, or is this mainly in Trastevere? No, it's common all over Italy, actually. So depending yeah. on where you are in Italy, you'll get different food, but... That's so what aperitivo is, is a drink and then usually you'll get like chips or olives or little crackers, something light. Some places will go a step further and uh, bring you little sandwiches or little pizzas. It's something that sort of started in the north. I mean, it's something that's always been common in the north. If you think of Venice, Cicchetti yeah. and Milan always had these buffets. And about, I would say, 25, 30 years ago, it started making its way down here. And now it's quite common. Could you share with us a few more, another uh, uh, insightful tidbit of Italian culture for Americans or non-Italians about exactly that, about trying to enjoy the sweetness of doing nothing? What, what is it? I know you have, you've broken your, your book down into various chapters, family life, food, which we talked to, uh, uh, leisure. Um, Share some, share with us some other instances and how we could just enjoy that. Well, I feel like um, the biggest chapter in my book is the food one, of course. Yeah. And um, I talk about, so there aren't like, there are specific things, but it has to be a change in your whole lifestyle. So for example, shopping for food, it shouldn't be a chore. It can become something fun. So for me, I mean, we're lucky in Italy, there's farmer's markets in every neighborhood open air markets with beautiful fruits and vegetables. And one of my favorite things to do is to go to these markets and chat with the women that are shopping there, talk with the people, the vendors and ask for recipes. And that's become one of my favorite things to do. And then another thing I talk about is eating with the seasons. I feel like nowadays we've sort of forgotten about seasons. Like we have tomatoes year long, we have strawberries year long. But it's kind of fun to wait all year for those summer tomatoes or those spring fava beans. And then you have a month to cook with them or a couple of weeks and you just enjoy. It becomes fun. It's like something you look forward to all year. And I think also another thing that is important and something that I talk about uh, in the Italian table and that Sophie talks about, too, is that you have to take the time to eat. <laughs> yeah. You know, eating on the run is not something that's good for you. It's not something uh, that makes you feel good. You know, eating in front of your computer or eating while you're walking down the street or eating a sandwich on the subway are things that, uh, for the most part, Italians wouldn't do. I mean, even if they're by themselves, they'll sit down. And even if it's only 10 minutes and even if it's only a sandwich, they'll sit down at a table, take the time to eat their sandwich, and then get on with their day. And I think making... Um, Making a point of having a meal, you know, if it's with yourself or with one other person, is a way to incorporate the sweetness of doing nothing into your life. So, on the subject of seasonality and going through the farmers market, I'm thinking. I mean, the one that I know because my 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 uh, experience in Rome is limited is the Campo di Fiore. Um, Let's talk artichokes. I mean, this is something that you have in both of your books, uh, recipes, Sophia, you had, uh, Sophie, you have in yours. Elizabeth, uh, in this Rome one, and I know this is Rome, you have three or four artichoke recipes. 
just talk a little bit of the magic uh, of artichokes. Well, first of all, they're just gorgeous to look at. <laughs> I mean, and they're so weird. I mean, I always think like, how did somebody decide this thing was edible? Um, you know, it was, it's just this, you know, thorny kind of thing. And, and the one thing that people, uh, don't realize is I think in America, you have this sort of one type of globe artichoke and you eat it in this one specific way. And, you know, by boiling it and sort of eating the pulp off the leaves and maybe dipping it in butter. Instead in Italy, there's as many different ways to eat artichokes as there are towns. I was just in Sicily, for instance, and had this amazing artichoke cooked by a lady in a market in the coals. And, you know, it was fantastic. And here in Rome, uh, they're considered to be some of the best artichokes in Italy. And they come from just outside of in the countryside. And they're huge. And the first ones, um, I think probably you've heard uh, the deep fried artichokes, um, where they trim them and then deep fry them twice. So they're open up and they're like crispy and you can eat the whole thing. And, um, and then as the season goes on and the artichokes, you know, come up from Sicily, they come from Sardinia, you get other kinds of recipes. You know, you can make pasta, you can make frittata. Um, Yesterday I made a spring recipe called Vignarola, and I believe it's in my book. And it's a spring, um, it's a mix of all the spring vegetables. So there's peas, fava beans, artichokes, asparagus, mm. did I miss anything? And lettuce, lettuce is in season now. Peas, and peas. Yeah, I said peas. peas and fava beans. Yeah. <laughs> and you basically cook them all together with um, onion, olive oil, salt, pepper, and it's the best. But it's also such a mm. specific thing because those like four vegetables only are in the same season for like two minutes of the year. So, I mean, it's something that, that Romans look forward to and really enjoy. So it's Mother's Day coming up. Uh, I don't think this is a much of a celebration in Italy, but in the States it is. We've got two days. I, I want to talk about the mother-daughter relationship here. So Elizabeth, you started your, your blog, uh, 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 Elizabeth McKinley in Rome. And Sophie, you started contributing to that. How did you start? Well, first of all, Elizabeth, how did you start the blog? What made you decide I to was, do that? I was, and it I was a, a I was an art historian, then I became a journalist. And I was a journalist for 20 years and wrote for magazines and newspapers. And I wrote nine books. And, and so I was writing in print during the golden age of you know publishing. And, um, and that sort of all changed with the internet. And um, which meant that at first it was really great. And then I was, you know, magazines aren't what they used to be and newspapers as well. And so I continued wanting to write. And so I started a blog and this was, like, I think about 13 years ago. And, um, and so the blog was great and I loved it. And, but blogs don't really, you know, make a lot of money. They never really have. Um, so I had to find a way to monetize and, you know, cause I had a career. And um, so I wrote an app called yes. Italy. And that was a guide to eating in all throughout Italy. And then I also started getting requests to do something that people were calling like a food tour. I, I don't even know at the beginning if they were saying food tour. They just said, can you just take us around and eat with us? And I thought, well, this sounds really weird because there was no such thing then. And we're talking about 12 years ago. And so I started doing that at first. And I started doing around Campo di Fiore and the Jewish ghetto and Festevere. And um, it turned out to be like a business and the business grew so much that by the time Sophie graduated from university in London and she came here and she had different jobs and she wasn't, I don't know, you're going between jobs. And I just said, you know what, why don't you try and do one of these food tours? And I thought she had gone crazy. Like <laughs> what food tour? I asked my dad if she was okay. <laughs> she sort of for she really had I to did. force me her. to I try her. and do a food tour. And I was so nervous. And then I did my first food tour, I guess nine years ago now, and I loved it. I mean, there's no job, no other job I would rather do. It's the perfect job for me. It's the only thing I'm meant to be doing. And we were also, I mean, I was, I was very lucky to start doing it before other people were doing it in Rome. And um, I also had, you know, the app and the blog before other people had it in Italy. So we're now at the point where both of us have, you know, a lot of people that follow us and read what we write. And so we have a lot of requests for tours. And with, since our since people want to do tours, we're expanding. And we not only do the food tours here in Rome, we do uh, week-long tours in Umbria, in Sicily, in Puglia, oh, wow. in Parma. And um, yeah, we're starting to collaborate with people. I collaborate with Melissa Clark from the New York Times. 
with Evan Kleiman from KCRW, who did a tour with Elizabeth Gilbert. And um, and so we do, uh, we collaborate with people and I don't know, there's more, I wish we had more time. The week long tours are so much fun. So it's basically fun. a week of eating, <laughs> drinking, exploring and eating again. It's like camp, it's like camp. Yeah. <laughs> and they're what small. Is what is, now, when you go on a when when you when you lead a food tour, is it with a small group? Do you say you you know, you ask ahead of time what kinds of experience do you want, and then you plan it out, or are people specific saying yeah, I want to? We have, a, we have specific itineraries, and um, you know we can send you the brochure, and you can decide whether or not to sign up. And they're limited to uh, ten or twelve, ten to twelve people, and the so they go really quickly. The tours. Right. They sell out very quickly. And um, yeah, and then people show up and we go from Sunday night to Saturday morning and basically eating our way through the week. We visit cheese makers and olive oil makers. We do also a lot of artisans we visit, which we, we love doing. And we take care of everything like accommodation and transportation and meals. Oh, every wow. holiday and relax. It's like <laughs> it's like come to Italy and be our friends and hang out yeah. with us. <laughs> And, and of course, the slaughterhouses, the slaughterhouse area has recently, I would say relatively recently, become a big destination for uh, quote unquote foodies. Oh, you mean testaccio in Rome? The testaccio, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's been for a while. It's, I would say, the place where all the really traditional Roman restaurants are. So most of my friends, when they go out to dinner, that's where they go. And also, it has an amazing uh, market. And right. It not only sells meat, fruits, and vegetables, but it also has great street food. So you can actually, it's probably one of the few markets in Rome where you can actually go get some food and sit down and enjoy your meal in the market. And it's yeah. great because it's loved by both tourists and locals. So it's a good mix of both. But it's a very cool working class area. If you're in Rome and you have more than a few days, you should go explore it for sure. Okay, I definitely will, for sure. Somebody's asking a question here. Um, Allison was asking, is there a place or area of Rome where you suggest visitors seek out to mm. experience Dolce Far Niente uh, sort of as a restorative break? Um, I think one of the great things in Rome are the parks. And there's so many, Rome is a very, very green city. And so Villa Borghese is beautiful, Dore Pamfili. So there's a lot of places to just, you know, if you want to just sort of take a picnic there and, and hang out don't you think yeah yeah but also like on the a lot of people sit on the steps of churches on benches all over like you'll constantly see just people sitting down and taking a rest or having a coffee at a bar there's so many different options yeah oh wonderful so i uh, work oh and then uh, sophie you started your instagram so we have the blog and then sophie started uh which has become really popular your your instagram yeah. And, and what 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 uh, drew you to that? Is it just your generation? You're just like, you know what? I'm going to. I have an Instagram page too. She actually, you do. Who started? Who had it? Who's who had the Instagram first? So she taught me how to use Instagram. I can barely send an email. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, I love that. Excellent. My apologies. Go. I have a YouTube channel. You know, I'm not <laughs> much more technological than me. <laughs> But yeah, she taught me how to use Instagram, but uh, yeah, I take all the pictures and videos myself and uh, I love it. It's just, it's a way to show people for both of us, the way we live and what we do in Italy. And right. so people come on our tours, whether it be the day tours in Rome or the week long tours in Italy, they already know what to expect, the things we like, the things we eat, the places we go to. But it's also a way for us to connect. And I think that was brought home right. really strongly in 2020. You know, when we were up in Umbria, uh, Sophie and me with my husband, and um, we were able to connect with people in a really special way. We, we did a lot of cooking videos, but we were also able to show people what we were growing in our garden, how we were walking around. And I don't know, it was really, it was, it was a, a great thing. Yeah. Now, do you lead your tours uh, together or divide and conquer? I mean, you must do it separately. No, both. Oh, so wow. up until so, I now take care of the Rome tours, and we're also hiring um, more people to do the Rome tours because there's so much requests. And then the week long tours, we've been doing them together for years, for ten years. And just this year is the first one where we're actually starting to separate 
very sad. I know. It's like we don't, we don't really. I mean, we like it, but but we get lonely too. I mean, yeah. it's nice. But we're doing. We're starting a tour uh, tomorrow Sunday night. We're going to Umbria, and we're doing it together. And I think we're both. Yeah. Happy yeah. But I just did my first uh, solo week long tour in Puglia a week ago. I think it ended, and it went great. It was amazing. I missed her a lot, but it was so much fun. But it's a way for obviously us to do more tours. Right. Right. Uh, any any chances of doing them in Calabria? Well, we'd love to. We'd love to. We've um, thought about it. We just we're missing the time. There's a lot of places in Italy would like to do more tours. Um, I started working on a tour in um, in below the Amalfi Coast. It's an area called Cilento, which mm. is the lesser known part of Campania. I started planning that. We need more time, <laughs> but yeah, we've thought about Calabria a lot. Mm. Our our base. Of, how we decide where to do tours is that we um, we used to do a week long tour in Rome, but we decided that Rome actually didn't need more tourists. So we try and bring people to places that are a little bit off the beaten track. And um, Calabria is certainly there. We did I did a tour in Abruzzo, um, but then there's a fine balance between off the beaten track and is there actually a hotel? <laughs> right. Uh, right. Good or, or is there Good a track? to drive on and so we're, we're always looking for you know places to be able to bring people to where you know we can lead a week-long tour and calabria's we talk about it all the time yeah it's still uh, a place to be and, and it is a little bit difficult to get around especially with all the mountain towns uh um and uh the the roads which are which are fine but it is pretty spread out and and uh kind of tough to get to so Sophie, when you when you wrote this book, it, at what point you know, your your mother has written? You said nine, correct, Elizabeth? Correct. Was this an inspiration for you? Just saying, you know what, my mom has done this. I want you know, I I can do this. And at what point did you you know show what you were writing to your mother, if at all? I mean, at what like what was that process like for you of writing of writing the book? So I feel like my process of writing the book was a little different than most people. And okay. I was also very lucky. So the publishing house actually got in touch with me with an idea. And I'd always th thought I wanted to write a book, but I right. thought like, oh, whatever. Maybe I'll do it later in life. It'll happen. She, one day she says, look, I just got this email from somebody called Harper Collins. <laughs> 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 is, is, what is that? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, they had an idea for a book and they were like, we would like you to do it and we give you complete freedom. So that was amazing for a first book experience. Yeah. I got to write about what I liked and what I wanted. And I mean, you were very, very disciplined. Well, because the only I hated school all my life. The only thing I've always loved at school was writing. Oh, wow. <laughs> but also our our you know, we lead tours all year long. And so there's certain months that we leave free for us to do other things. And so you knew you had literally two months to write the book. Mm. And she went and sat down every single day until, and I actually didn't read it until the very end. You didn't yeah. give me a lot to read. And, and I thought, you know, you would, I actually thought you would need a lot more help. And she didn't need, I barely corrected grammar. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> I, I think I remember in the beginning, it was just like, how do I start writing a book? And that's what she helped me with. Like, how do you actually oh, wait, start? No, the beginning, <laughs> you couldn't figure out where your desk was going to be. <laughs> she ended up yeah. sitting on the floor in the living room, which turned out to be. The yeah, best. I was most comfortable there. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, like I said, tomorrow is, or t in two days is Mother's Day. And just getting advice. I'm going to open this up uh, to questions from uh, our viewers, listeners. So please start thinking those questions, put them in the uh, question chat, and I will get to them. Um, but as far as planning an event, what what would you do for Mother's Day? What would be a meal that you might prepare uh, for, for your mom? Uh, and actually, I realize I have one more question, but go ahead. Well, I feel like we since we work together and we live very close to each other every day is like mother's day to yeah, us no i know like we always we are very lucky to get along so well so we're always doing some things that i consider very special we go out for lunch a lot we have dinner and we cook dinner together we work together um yeah somehow mother's day is not a big 
thing. We we're more likely to you know do a big thing on for another holiday like Christmas and, and cook together. Yeah, like Easter, we like doing a lot together because yeah. it's all the spring vegetables that we love. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, actually, so that that uh, brings to mind as we're talking about mothers. Uh, um, you have a whole section in there, or, or a chapter on mothers, and and uh, the role mothers play in Italy. And you have this. You you said that the average, uh, the average child of any age, really, it could be an adult uh, child, uh, uh, calling uh, will call his or her mother three to four times a day. And you say something along the lines: this uh, this is one of the most. Uh, this is how the uh, cell phones are used the most. It's true. I love that. Well, I call her a thousand times a day. But it's, it's just, it's not even a conversation. It's just like, hi, I'm alive. Did you have coffee today? Yes. Okay, what, what's, what's the cat doing? Yeah, what's the cat doing? <laughs> but um, if you could hear people's conversations on the streets, a lot of them are happening with their moms on the phone. Mm. Like, what do you want me to buy for dinner? What did you cook for dinner? Did you do the laundry? Yeah. <laughs> You need to pick up anything here. It's just la mama, la mama, la mama. <laughs> but yeah, Italians, they, their mom is like a divinity. It's just yeah. like the most important figure in their life. Wonderful. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to uh, just open up to uh, a couple of questions here. I think uh, one question, somebody's going to Umbria in the yes. middle of September for a week, staying near Todi. Is there yeah. anything you would recommend? Yeah, if you go to my website and you just type in Todi and Umbria, there's lots and lots of recommendations for our restaurants and, and our favorite places to go. Good, excellent. Um, so here's a question. Given that Italians are driven by relationships rather than say convenience, it must have been incredibly, there must have been incredible distance when COVID shut everything down and you couldn't visit your spots or your bars as we we're talking about or commune with other foods in particular. It was hard for us here, of course, but, but it, uh, uh, this person writes, it was gut wrenching for Italians. What, what is it like then? And what's it like now? Uh, it's a good question. It was very hard during lockdown because Italians are such social people, whether it be family or friends. I think the hardest part about uh, lockdown was not being able to see people. And even for the older generation, like on my Instagram, those who follow me, they know I film every morning a group of men that go to the bar I love in Trastevere and they play cards together every morning all their life for years. And just to think that they're alone at home, a lot of them, their wives passed away, they don't have a job, they're retired. And to think they were alone for three months is, is very sad. But then again, now if you come to Italy, it's as if nothing happened. Everyone's completely back to normal. Hugging, kissing, playing cards, <laughs> going out for dinner. Life is back to normal. Really? Now? Yeah, and, yeah. and are people wearing masks indoors or what's how how is it in yes. Rome, say, versus elsewhere? Rules. Yeah, the rules changed on, on May 1st. May 1st. And um, although you're you're not required to wear a mask uh, inside restaurants and stores anymore. Uh, in stores, I find people, at least the people working there, are still wearing masks. And most people in respect for those people are putting their masks on. Yeah, it's recommended. So yeah. I so still, like, when I go into a shop, I ask the owners, do you want me to wear a mask? And if they have a mask on, we usually just put it on. Today yeah. I went, you know, I was at the hairdresser today and everybody was wearing masks. And it's just sort of for respect to the people who are working there. Yeah, I went to a supermarket yesterday and you're not supposed to wear it. You don't have to. Everyone was wearing it. So oh, people, really? Yeah. Yeah, I think they're very respectful of the people who have, because all the places like, you know, the, the food stores never closed in Italy. So I think people are very respectful uh, of the people who are, you know, providing these services. And so very happy to, nobody, nobody complains about wearing a mask in Italy. No, everyone's been great. Mm. And we're, we're like 85% vaccinated. So it's, oh, that's it's, wonderful. it feels very safe here. Yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions here. Um, anyone else, please uh, type in the chat. Um, walks in Rome. If you were to have two to three hours to take a walk, um, 
which one would you recommend? Where where would you start and end, and what where would it take you through? Just to show you, just to give a sense of the of 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 the city itself and its various histories. Um, I guess the historic center of Rome isn't that huge, so you could walk through the whole thing in one day. I mean, yeah. obviously, it's better if you have more time. But like for instance, if you walk from the Colosseum all the way to Piazza del Popolo, right? That, that's you've crossed Rome. Yeah. You know, and you've seen a lot. And um, yeah, I was going to say go even further. So start in Monti near the Colosseum and then make your way to like the Spanish Steps, Trevi Fountain, then cross over to the Pantheon, Piazza Navona, Campo dei Fiori, Jewish Ghetto, and then Trastevere. Yeah, and which we did, you know, for when we were here and things sort of started opening up and we could take walks and there was nobody else here, we would take huge walks you know all over rome and and you really realize how small it is what for you uh uh either one of you or both elizabeth and sophie the place for you and rome to go to that may be a tourist destination or may not but but the spot for you where you go for that um uh that sense of tranquility or maybe even familiarity or that sense where where you allow yourself to decompress what is that um, for us it's always about food so i would say there's <laughs> there's a few restaurants that we've been going to since i was a baby and it's mm -hmm. very special when nowadays especially we manage to get together and go have a nice meal there and uh, on instagram we have a lot of like guides and free advice on all our favorite restaurants so if anyone has specific restaurants with name um, questions about restaurants and names of places instagram would be easier instead of us listing them here Oh, uh, great. And so we have a question here. I will hopefully be taking my 12 year old daughter in Rome in the near future for a short visit before seeing friends in Sicily. Uh, do you have any place or walk in Rome that might be wonderful to captivate a child's imagination for the first time in Rome um, and perhaps uh, stop at a gelateria as well? Well, I always think that uh, I mean, yes, always work food into everything and know, sort of plan out where you're going to stop for gelato, pizza, keep your keep your 12 year old fed because they're hungry. But my um, my 13 year old niece was recently visiting. And one of the best things that we did was hire a guide to take us to the Coliseum and and also to the forum. And we sort of did these things which seem like maybe a 12 year old is not going to be interested in them. If you have a guide who actually tailors the tour to that age, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, because all of a sudden it becomes alive and you're talking about the gladiators and you're talking about mythology, which, you know, 12 year olds start to start to study then. And I thought that was really, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Invest in a guide. And gelato is like coffee bars. They're on every corner yeah. in Rome. <laughs> you won't have trouble finding gelato. But make sure you take time. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. So do we have any, oh, uh, do we have another question here? Let me just open this up. Okay, so that was the one we just uh, we just read. So that's great. Uh, could you give a little more, um, uh, talk a little more on the parks and green spaces in Rome? Elizabeth mentioned a few. I love thinking of Rome, uh, Clary Delano writes, as a green city. I think that gets missed. Well, there's, if you look at Rome uh, from Google Maps, you'll see how green it is. Mm. And there's even uh, a lot of piazzas have been restored in recent uh, years. For instance, Piazza Vittorio has this great park in the center of it, which which is really, really gr uh, wonderful. And, and there's a lot of benches and, <clears throat> and and places to go. There's even a small you know park near Campo di Fiore called Piazza Cairoli, which people tend to overlook. But if you sort of look at Google Maps and, and you can see that just the green spots. The green spots. There's a lot. Good. Uh, we have another. Uh, we just have uh, room for maybe one or two more questions here, uh, only because I, I realize we're 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 kind of getting close to time. So here's a question. I'm teaching a course on contemporary Italian culture studies next semester, and look forward to using your books. What would you say the biggest changes have been in Italy in the last ten years? The biggest changes for me is the um, the amount of tourism. In, in the big cities. I've seen such huge changes over the last, say, 12 years in the center of Rome, Florence, and Venice. And so um, that affects the way that you live these cities, but it also should encourage you to sort of go 
take the train for the day to Orvieto, for instance, mm -hmm. very easy to do. Um, and, you know, try and get to the smaller places. And then it uh, looks like we have a fan here saying, have you ever thought of filming your tours or just your daily experiences in Italy? It could easily see something like this on the Food Network. Well, I guess we do it daily on our own on Instagram. So if you start following us, you'll see that we're always posting about our food tours and we're documenting that. and On our stories. Yeah, our stories. And um, I guess, yeah, maybe in the future there'll be a show somewhere. We don't, we thought about it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. Well, I wanted to thank you so both so much for for coming on, talking to all of us here uh, at the Montclair Literary Festival. Any closing words of wisdom or uh, advice you want to give before we yeah, say goodbye? We're here. We, I mean, obviously, buy Sophie's book, buy, buy our books, but also come visit us. You know, come come do a tour with us, or or just come on your own. It's 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 a great time to to travel in Italy now. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for your time and your uh, advice and um, your books, really. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck me. with the rest of the festival. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. 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 Thank you all, uh, my uh, the viewers and listeners here. Um, we have a whole day. Uh, we have an evening of event here for those of you in the Montclair area uh, uh, tonight. Um, and throughout the day tomorrow, uh, you could go to uh, just Google Montclair Literary Festival, or maybe in the chat, we could put in the link here. Um, we've got lots of amazing events, fiction, poetry, poetry slams, um, books on politics, sports, um, Latinx writers, everything. Um, so look it up and thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, I'll see you throughout the festival. Bye-bye.